RC Online, thank you so much for joining us. Let's worship. Come on, yay! I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Hey! I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Yes, my Belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. sons and daughters bow with blood and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started yes our god will finish what he started oh, this is my testimony from death to life because grace real Come on, let's sing it out. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. Hey, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. Let's sing this song together. We sang it last week. It's called Breakthrough. Pray breakthrough in your lives today. Let's sing it out together. I am weary from the waves Crashing over every day God of mercy, please come rescue me
together shake the mountains break the walls apart open the heavens almighty god you are overcomer defender of my Sing it out together, shake the mountains, shake the mountains, break the walls apart. Let's continue to worship today. There's no one beside, no one beside. The Lord is our help 
and our fortress and our time in need. Let's sing it together. Within my heart is a melody that was not taught. In the darkest night, it still goes on. The anthem of my God within my heart is a treasure that cannot be bought. When all else is faded, it will not. The presence of my God, oh, magnify the Lord. Let us sing song His name together. No one beside.
God, thank you so much for this time of worship today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Thank you for that promise. Jesus, we worship you today. God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come before you, to sing your praises, to lift up our hands, to shout your name. We love you so much. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Church of Celebration Online today. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us. And if you're a guest choosing to join us today, thank you so much for taking time and making COC your place of worship this weekend. We are so, so excited about this current series we're in, Hashtag Relationship Goals. And we're actually wrapping it up today with week number four called Covenant Keeping. If you've missed any of those previous weeks, you can go to our website and check that out at any time. We've been talking about relationships. We've been talking about marriage. And we've been talking, if you're single, about your future marriage or your future relationship and how very, very important it is to have biblical, sound doctrine style goals for your relationships and your marriages. So let me recap just a, a real quick review of what we've been talking about from week to week. We believe there's four solid biblical principles that should go into every relationship and every marriage. In the first week, we said that, that it, uh, you should have a Christ-centered goal for your marriage or for your relationship. And if you remember what we talked about that first week, we said that there is a big difference between calling yourself a Christian and actually being Christ-centered. And uh, one of the things that we kind of helped you with is easing into that first goal was just simply saying this. One way to become Christ-centered in your own life and in your relationships is just start praying. Start enhancing your relationship with your wife or with your husband. And if you're single, with, with God. Just begin by praying. And then we moved into the second goal that we talked about. Once we're Christ-centered, then we move towards being mission-driven. That is a vital goal for all marriages and for relationships. And we kind of asked the question with a biblical answer of why should we get married? And that particular week with mission-driven is we said that we should get married because we actually can serve God better together than we can apart. And uh, one foundational idea with that mission-driven idea and goal is this. What you need to understand is within your marriage and within your relationships, what God seeks to unite, Satan schemes to divide. That's why being mission-driven is so difficult and it's ongoing. It's much harder to work at being mission-driven than it is just by simply praying. So it's kind of step-by-step. Then last week we talked about how important it is to be devil kicking in our marriages, in our relationship, because Satan wants to distract us. He wants to seduce us. He's after us being Christ centered. He's after us being mission driven. So we need to do everything that we can to be on alert and be prepared to guard our relationships in our marriage against him. And kind of one of those ideas we said last week with devil kicking is if this is the line, then I want to stay as far away from the line as possible. 
And, and one of those big ideas last week was simply this, is why, why would I want to face a temptation in the future when I hold the power to eliminate it today? So more or so last week was about you need to be aware and become aware that you have an adversary who hates God and he hates you. So you need to become devil kicking. So this week we're going to talk about how maybe we can redefine our marriages a little bit because so many marriages today are based more so as a casual approach or a contractual approach. But marriage, biblically speaking, was defined and designed to be covenantal in its approach. So let's kind of start here today with our fourth and final goal. Let's be really real and honest as we're watching this. Sometimes, let's face it, things don't always go or end up exactly as maybe you had planned or envisioned in your relationships. So, for example, those of us that are married today, let me ask you it right now at home where you're sitting and watching this. Let me just ask you, how many of you married somebody that's really completely the opposite of you? You can raise your hand with an emoji on the screen or, or just type in raise hands like you know. Like Ginger and I are, are pretty opposite. So here's what I want you to understand. It's natural to be attracted or drawn towards someone opposite of you. It is true what they say that opposites attract. But let me tell you something in case you didn't know this about opposites. Just as opposites attract... It's very problematic because opposites also attack, and they attack more often. Um, for example, there's probably many marriages today where you have a saver and you have a spender, or maybe you have an organizer or whatever you call the other person. I'm the organizer, okay, so you know what I'm saying. You have a punctual and you have just a flexible, happy-go-lucky, go with everything. And what you often find in those types of scenarios where those are completely opposite, right? Opposites attract, but a lot of times in those types of scenarios, opposites also tend to attack. And it usually comes down when the relationship has gone to another level and it keeps building and getting bigger in the relationship. That's why it's vital for us to kind of have goals in our relationships, and more importantly, biblical goals. So let's talk a little bit about our last particular goal. What exactly does it mean to be covenant keeping? And the best way to understand what that goal is all about is just by simply looking at the scriptures. If you got your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm sure it will be on the screens in a minute. But Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 10, tells us this. Some Pharisees came to him, that being Jesus, to test Jesus, him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus replied, haven't you read that at the beginning the creator made them male and female? He then continued and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. He's repeating Old Testament here. So they're no longer two, but now they've become one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So they asked, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But if... But it was not this way from the beginning. God said, that, that's not the original design. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, and marries another woman, actually is committing adultery. That's kind of like a ouch. Wow. And then the next part I find kind of funny, because the disciples are listening to this conversation, and then they chime in and they say, well, if that's the situation between a husband and a wife, man, it's better not even to marry at all. What's, what, what's the use then, is what they said. So if you've been with us from previous weeks, you might remember, and I've already said it in this message, that we've been saying quite a few times that what God seeks to unite the enemy's schemes and seeks to divide. 
So before we really, really dive into this idea of covenant keeping marriage, let me first share with you the three most common approaches to marriage today. So you understand where we're coming from as we really emphasize and talk about covenant keeping. Here they are up front. If you're a note taker, you'll want to write these down. They'll probably be on your screen as well. But the first approach, most common approach to marriage is known as the casual approach. The casual approach. Uh, This is when two people basically think that marriage is just not that big of a deal. All right. Then the second most common approach is the contractual approach to marriage. This is when two people think that marriage is more of a contract. You basically sign the dotted lines and the two of you now have a mutual agreement. And then the third most common approach is known as the covenantal approach. This is when two people think and believe that marriage is truly a holy covenant before and established by God. So let's talk about the casual approach so you understand. Let me break it down for you, all right? Whenever somebody has a casual approach towards marriage, then basically, it's it's not all the time, but in most scenarios, they will also have a casual approach to sex, all right? Oftentimes, this is kind of their thought process. Hey, listen, as long as we are two consenting adults and we agree, um, and, and it's really nobody's business anyway, if we both agree. We're, we're not hurting anybody, and, and the last time I checked sex, sex feels pretty good, so we might as well do it whenever we want, with whoever we want, because it's really no big deal. That's the, the casual mindset. But the problem with this, and trust me, I know because I've been doing this long enough as a pastor and heard enough stories, the problem with that type of thinking is this. That type of thinking evolves. It evolves over time. Because marriage isn't that big of a deal in their mindset and sex isn't that big of a deal in their mindset, then if we love, or in most cases, (laughs) at least like somebody a lot, we might as well then just move in together. We might as well just move in together. That's the next logical step, right? It really doesn't matter. And, and it actually is probably more convenient. Now, if you're living together today with somebody, please hear my heart. My goal today is not, it's not to bring shame or embarrassment upon anybody that might be watching or listening today, all right? But my goal is to maybe just talk it through with you a little bit. Give me like five, 10 minutes with this particular approach and, And let me maybe help you understand a little bit more as to what you might be existing in. That's that's what my goal is. In other words, what it could end up meaning if you really think that marriage is no big deal. That's what I'm talking about. So let's just say we're going to live together. I'll I'll play it out in a scenario. Let's say we're just going to live together and we're going to do some things that are typically reserved for married couples, right? So for example, um, you're going to move in with somebody and you're going to put your toothbrush in the little toothbrush holder in the bathroom and they're going to put theirs in their little toothbrush holder. You're going to put your clothes uh, together in in the same little drawer. You're going to share the bills together. Um, You're going to share your same address. You might even share every once in a while the the, uh, same sandwich together. And you might even, you might even actually, since you're living together, you might even share the same bed together. Essentially, essentially with those things, if we're really being honest today, all right, you're basically doing married things even though you're not really married, right? Right? So let's say, all right, let's keep the scenario going. Let's say that after several months down the road, things get a little rocky and they're not working out, okay? Okay. So what happens is you take your toothbrush out of the little toothbrush holder, you take your half of the sandwich, and you guys break up. And you go along with your life, and then you find somebody else. A few months later, if things work out with that new somebody else, guess what you do? What your natural tendency is to do it all over again and start with that person. Your casual mindset. Let's try this again. 
But then, but then weeks, months, and years from now, what will happen is eventually you might meet what you think is the perfect somebody. You know what I'm talking about. It's that moment where all the love songs that you listen to on the radio just make sense. And you realize this might be finally that special someone that I'm willing to make a commitment to. I'm willing to take the next step, move beyond casual, and actually marry this person. So here's what happens. You, you do. You marry this person. But just like in any marriage, and you talk to anybody that's been married for any amount of time, they'll tell you marriage gets complicated. You know what I'm talking about. Like she squeezes the toothpaste from the middle of the tube and that bothers you. You want to work from the bottom all the way up and that starts to bother you over time. He leaves the toilet seat up. She never puts uh, the chips away. They're always laying out on the, on the counter with, with open and no clip on them. He's always leaving his boxers on the floor. So when things get difficult over and over and over again with your marriage, many people today just say this when they're in the casual mindset. Let's just break it off. It doesn't seem to be working. I thought you were the right one. You're not the right one. So let's go our separate ways and let's just divorce. And here's my point to all of that scenario. Please don't miss this. One of the biggest reasons for divorce today is because a lot of people have done nothing in their previous relationships except played house. They've pretended to be married. And in essence, they've practiced divorce with one person after the next person after the next person. So for many today, unfortunately, it's true. Marriage is just no big deal. Therefore, sex is no big deal deal. And that, friends, is what a casual approach to marriage looks like. So let's look at what a contractual approach looks like. A contractual approach is an interesting one because the problem with the contractual approach to marriage is basically that's all the marriage is. It's a contract, all right? It's a contract. A contract, if you know anything about it, it's generally temporary and it's an agreement between two sides to basically agree to meet the standards and requirements under the contractual terms that are finally met or broken or breached. So it then gives legal grounds to break the contract. For example, many of us are in contract with our mortgage companies, right? If you own a house today, you're in a contract with your mortgage company. And if you pay, you stay. But if you don't pay, guess what happens? You move away. That's as simple as it is. It's a contractual agreement. In essence, here's what a contract does. A contract limits responsibilities and it also defines responsibilities. So if we enter into a marriage and say that it's a contract, it's a legal binding, then as long as you live up to your agreed upon terms, then basically we have a deal, right? But if you don't live up to your agreed upon terms, meaning you betray me, you lie to me, you hurt me, you make me unhappy, then guess what, dude? You broke your contract. You broke your contract to me. Therefore, I'm no longer bound by the contract. So then we go our separate ways because there's been a violation. There's been a violation. Friends, that's why divorce courts are full of people doing nothing more than suing one another over breach of contract, over breach of contract. So we have the casual approach to marriage. It's not that big of a deal. And we have the contractual approach to marriage. We sign the dotted line. As long as you live up to your terms and I live up to my terms, then we'll be happy. But if you break your terms, you break the contract, then I'm getting out of my contract. So your marriage is based on basically a debt and debtor style of a relationship. So let's spend the majority of our time here as we move towards the ending of the message. I'm not quite there yet, so hang with me. 
talking about the right approach to marriage, the biblical approach to marriage, the covenantal approach. You see, the covenantal approach is not based on mutual distrust like the other two are so much. It's not temporary like the other two. It's not motivated by self or selfish preservation like the other two. Instead, a covenant is based on a mutual and unconditional, no matter what, commitment. Motivated, driven, fueled by a sacrificial love for one another. Now I know, I know this, okay? Most of us, when we get married, we don't often think that we're actually entering into a covenant. I mean, that's like a really holy church Bible word. It's not a commonly used word word today, but I'm here to tell you covenant is a highly spiritual and extremely important word uh, when it comes to marriage. The word covenant is actually derived from an Old Testament Hebrew word that is actually pronounced this way, berit, berit. And what it means is it means a cutting, like a knife and a cutting, all right? So when you see a covenant, and a berit in the Bible, then there's always going to be a shedding of blood. That's what berit means, a shedding of blood. Let me break it down for you. In the Old Testament, if two people were to enter into a covenant with one another, all right, there would often be a shedding of blood from a bull or maybe like seven lamps, all right? They would kill the bull, and then they would cut the bull completely in half, and then the two people that were making a covenant with one another, all right, get this, they would walk around the bull together seven times, all right? And in essence, as they were walking around the bull, as they were saying, what has happened to this bull, it should happen to me if I were to break the oath or the covenant that I'm making with you. It was a very, very powerful visual demonstration of what a covenant meant. Let me break it down for you even further, all right? And let me describe to you what a Hebrew wedding really looks like. If you were to attend an Old Testament Hebrew wedding, you would see one of the most powerful covenantal ceremonies that you have ever seen in your life. Occasionally, what would happen is the priest would ask for the hands of both the bride and the groom, all right? Then the priest would take out a knife and he would nick the bride's hand and he would nick the groom's hand, all right? And then he would, the, the blood would emerge from their hands and that would signify that there is about to be a berit, a covenant, a shedding of blood. Then the priest would take their hands and he would join them together, overlap the blood from one another's hands. And basically that blood would mingle and that would signify what Leviticus says when it says the life of the person is in the blood. We are exchanging life. Then the priest would take a cloth or some type of rope and he would bind the hands together showing outwardly that the two are in process right now of becoming one. Then the next phase is they would take upon themselves and say and share their known covenant vows, both before family and friends and before God. Now stay with me, okay? Because we're just about ready to get a little bit PG-13, all right? They would then, after the covenant vows took place, they would then depart themselves, just the two of them, for a little bit of time, and they would go to a place called the chupa. It's like you're clearing your throat, chupa. They would go to the place of the chupa, all right? This is maybe where we get our English word hubba hubba, all right? I don't know, I'm, maybe, all right? But they would go to the chupa, and basically the chupa was known as basically the bridal suite or the honeymoon room. So they would leave the ceremony together. All the guests, all the guests stayed behind and waiting for them. And they would leave to go to the hoopah. And then in the hoopah, the virgin groom and the virgin bride would then commence and literally have sex for the very first 
time. Now, I'll go ahead and stop here because you can fill in the blanks. We're all adults. But after the shedding of the blood in this moment, in essence, they were signifying that they were now one flesh and one spirit. And once they sealed the holy covenant together, they would come back and they would go to the party that was waiting for them. Can you just imagine like after that took place, how awkward that would be when you came back to the party that had been waiting for you for the last 15, 30 minutes. You know what I'm talking about? What a reentrance that would be. Now, I tell you all of that intimate stuff because it all makes sense. And my goal and my hope is that you might better understand and truly begin to embrace and take to heart the truth that is this. Marriage matters. Marriage matters. Marriage is a very, very, very big deal to God. Matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 4, the first part says this. Marriage should be honored by all. The key word here is all. And the marriage bed should be kept pure. So according to this passage, marriage should be honored by all. Let me ask you a question at home today. Who does all mean? Who does all mean? In the Greek, guess what? All means, ready for this? All. All. There's no other words for it. All is all. So that means if you're a child, you honor the covenant of marriage. If you're a teenager with raging hormones, you honor the covenant of marriage. If you're 22 and single and you have your needs, you are supposed to honor the covenant of marriage. If you're 33 and waiting and dating so you can be mating, you are supposed to still honor the covenant of marriage. If you're 47 and you're divorced, you are still called to honor the covenant of marriage. That's what all means. All means all. Now the good news is this, because I know we kind of put some people back in their seats and they're like, whoa, seems like Pastor Josh was speaking just to me in that moment. That was some high heat. Here's the good news. If you're finding yourselves on the wrong end of all, and my definition and the biblical definition of all that I just shared with you today, the good news is this. If you're not part of all and you're not honoring God and you're not honoring marriage like God has commanded you to, you can stop. You don't have to keep going. And the beautiful part is God will forgive you. But he can't and won't forgive you unless you make the decision to stop. That choice is yours. It's one of the best, most incredible gifts that God gives to us is free choice. But if you choose to stop and start honoring the covenant of marriage, God will forgive you. You confess, you repent, and he'll forgive. That's his specialty. He makes all things what? Scripture says new, brand new. But the choice is yours. You have to choose. What do you want to be? What do you want your relationships to be? What do you want your future marriage to be? What do you want your current marriage to be? The choice is still yours. You choose. Nobody else can choose for you. Now, right about here is when I know some of you might be saying and thinking this. this I hear you, Pastor Josh. And you're making it sound as if it's easy peasy lemon squeezy. And, and, and it's got to be for you. I mean, gosh, you're married to Miss Ginger and she's amazing. And, and, the, and, and she's like Miss Perfect. But you have no idea, Pastor Josh. You have no idea what my marriage is like and how bad it is. So I want to acknowledge today, all right? I want to be empathetic, and I want you to know that I know, I really do know, for some of you that are listening and watching this today, 
that everything that we've kind of presented sounds incredibly complicated. Everything we've been talking about this series is challenging. I know that for some of you, you're dealing, you're dealing with some massive betrayals. You're dealing with some serious dysfunction, some really hard pain, and in some circumstances, heaven forbid, even abuse. I understand that. My heart hurts for you, and I'm praying for you. I really want you to know that. I really do understand that some of your marriages are extremely complicated. But in saying that, I want to say this. In, in my defense, I can tell you right now that Josh and Ginger Barrett do not have the perfect marriage. If she were here today, she would be saying amen, clapping, standing up, saying hallelujah, okay? We do not have the perfect marriage, nor... Nor, let me say this, do we have the perfect family? We don't. In reality, th there is nothing, nothing easy about pastoring a church of 1,500 plus people. There is nothing easy about being a pastor's wife, th let alone trying to do those things and, and, and have a marriage and raising three children, one of them who's 20 years old and he's trying to figure out what life looks like, what becoming an adult looks like, one with special needs who requires constant supervision and attention 24 hours a day or we're going to be in trouble because the cops are going to be called on us because he did something wrong. Or one who's just entering her teenage years. I don't know where my sweet little girl has gone sometimes. I'll spare you the rest of the details. But I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that our schedule is as difficult as anybody's schedule. And I can also guarantee you that there's as many spiritual attacks on our lives as there really are on anybody else's, if not more. Because Satan doesn't care if I'm a pastor and you're not. All he sees is a child of God that he wants to de derail. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I promise you that I'm not saying all of that today. And I'm not asking you to pat me on the back or looking for sympathy nor downplaying. I'm not downplaying your complications. I share all of that with you so you understand that I do have an empathetic and an understanding heart. But taking into consideration our lives and all of our complications that we have to deal with, here, here's, here's what Ginger and myself decided a long time ago. All right? We decided in order to better navigate through the complications, we decided to say this, that our marriage is going to be as good as we want it to be. We put that on ourselves. We can make our marriage be what it will be, good or bad, taking in consideration all of the outside influence, all the outside interference, all of the parenting, all of the pastoring, all of those things. And I'm just saying mine, you've got your own. But we made a conscious decision to decide that our marriage is only going to be as good as we want it to be. We have a choice. It's our choice what we will make it be. So if I'm shooting straight with you today, which I hope I am because I'm your pastor and you would want nothing else, let me be real. Sometimes, sometimes we don't feel like being loving. Sometimes, we don't feel like forgiving. <laughs> sometimes we don't even feel like working on it. And sometimes we may not even feel like expressing love and being Christ-centered. I know, shock. I'm just being real. Just being honest. But my point to that, my point to that is this. Even though sometimes we don't feel like it, Every single day of our lives and every single day of your life, we do something. We do. We do something that we don't feel like doing. We do. We do. You know why we do that? Because down deep inside of all of us, we know that it's right. 
Whether or not we want to, whether or not we feel like it, we still do it because we know that it's right. Everything that we've been talking about today, as we're wrapping up this series and the entire series, really boils down to our understanding. Or maybe in some cases our misunderstanding of the character and the nature of God. That's the problem, friends, with most of our marriages and most of our relationships. Here's what I mean. Please don't miss this. Many of us think and live that when we go to God, it's more of kind of a, what's up, bro? It's a casual deal. It's a casual relationship with God. One where I usually go ahead and, you know, I, I know Jesus, we're homeboys, we're buddy, you know, right? It's casual. And I end up doing whatever I want to do anyway because it really doesn't matter. Why? Because he's going to forgive me anyway. And that's your approach. That's your relationship with God. It's casual. Some of us think and we live this way as we go to God. This is what our relationship looks like. It's more of a contractual relationship with God. More of a contractual deal with Him. Like if I live up to my part and He lives up to His, right? But the problem is, is we're human. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. So we never, we never live up to our part. We never live up to our part. And Satan snuck his way into our life. And that leaves us feeling unworthy or afraid and, and of ever going back to him. Why? Because we broke the contract. And he's going to go ahead and cancel the contract because our relationship is debt and debtor. And our relationship with him is contractual. So we live distant from God. And many of us go to God. We break up with God and walk away because we didn't live up to our end of the deal. Then we go back to God and do the same thing over and over and over again. Our relationship with God is contractual. But the truth is today, friends, the truth about God is that our relationship with Him was never, ever, ever meant to be casual, nor was it meant to be contractual. Our relationship with God was designed and created to be covenantal. Covenantal. And that is the only way that we can truly experience the real and the rich and the meaningful relationship with Him and others in our lives. The bottom line is our choices when it comes to our marriages and our relationships, our choices need to be better. They need to be better. Our actions need to be clearer. They need to be more defined. And we need to start, and in some cases, we need to restart our marriages and our future marriages and our relationships. We need to start with a better relationship with God, a covenantal relationship with God one that's Christ-centered, one that's mission-driven, one that's devil-kicking, and one that's covenant-keeping. Our relationships, our relationships, including, big time, including our relationship with God. Listen, friends, it's only going to be as good as you choose it to be. God's made His choice. He wants a relationship with you. But our relationship with Him and our relationship with others is only going to be as good as we choose them to be. Would you bow your heads at home and close your eyes? Um, stick with me. I, I'm really almost done. If at any time that you've been watching this message today and you've realized you, you need a little bit more assistance on how or what to do with what you've heard. Maybe you need prayer or salvation. If you're watching from the Facebook platform, just send us a DM. we got prayer counselors ready to meet your need. Just say, I need prayer, or I'd like to know more about salvation. Send us the DM, and we will follow up with you immediately. If you're watching from the Open Network platform and you need live prayer, just simply click that button right now that says live prayer. I'd like to be saved. Push that button of I'd like to be saved or raise the hand for salvation. A prayer counselor will follow up with you. And if you're married today, one last shot for me to kind of tell you one important note. Whether your marriage is strong 
or struggling. All you know is you would like more spiritual guidance, more spiritual direction for a better marriage. Our our church wants to help you. We're starting a brand new marriage workshop over the weekend of September 18th and 19th. You can choose which track you want to take. There's four tracks. The Smart Step Bump Family, the Marriage Project, Communication and Conflict Resolution, and Love and Respect. It's only 20 bucks. And if you're interested at all, you can open your eyes, crack them just a little bit. You can probably see the information on the screens right now. All you got to do is type the word or text the word marriage, marriage, okay, um, to 520-201-2444. Or you can go to our website at any time and find out more. Um, so please consider being a part of that. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for joining us online for the hashtag Relationship Goal Series. Um, we're starting a brand new series next week. It's going to be blast. It's called No Way That Just Happened. No Way That Just Happened. And we're going to talk about four particular miracles from God that, we, that make us just like dumbfounded. Like no way that just happened and, 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 and how they might apply to our lives. So come back next week. Let me pray for us in closing today. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for having just a few weeks to speak into some marriages. Because I know that the marriages that we've spoken into are varied. There are some that are on the verge of death. There are some that are strong. There are some that are struggling. And we also had a chance to speak into the lives of single people, young adults that are not married, and what to look at and build as a foundation and put into place as a goal for their relationships and their future marriage. Thank you for giving us that opportunity. I pray that you'd move in someone's life this week. I pray for, for people to sign up for this workshop and, 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 and revolutionize and transform and revitalize their marriages, Lord. We love you and we praise you in your precious and your holy, holy, holy son's name. And all God's people said, type amens. We'll see you guys next week. Cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up its strongest fight. The cross has the final word.
place today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you next time. The cross has the final word.